So our next speaker uh, is Dr. Philip Flavigo, who is Global Privacy Council for Here Technologies, uh, which, as you probably know, uh, is uh, a very important global player uh, in uh, mapping data. And it's going to be really, really useful to get that global perspective uh, on an issue that, on the face of it, seems to be about the European Union, but really is about so much more. So, Philip, thank you. Thanks for having me. Um, so let me talk about uh, providing a little bit more background information about our company, Here Technologies. Uh, we are a location data company. Um, our owners um, are companies such as um, the big German car makers, BMW, Audi, Daimler, also international companies such as uh, Intel and Pioneer, and uh, recently also um, announced um, Continental and Bosch. Um, we are a location data company and our goal is to um, enable uh, or to build a digital representation of the physical world to enable the autonomous age um, or the autonomous world for everyone. Um, we are particularly strong in the auto uh, automotive space. Our origin is in automotive and we are currently collaborating with more than 20 companies including um, PSA and Toyota to build a high definition map to um, enable autonomous vehicles. Um, despite our origin in um, automotive, we are also particularly strong in some other verticals such as um, smart cities, um, the I IoT space, or um, insurances, telecoms, utilities, um, and so on. Um, we are a European company with headquarters uh, in the European Union. Uh, with um, roughly 8,000 employees in 56 uh, countries with global operations. Um, we are a data company. That means, um, obviously, GDPR and privacy is at the core and at the very center of our strategy. So, we had to do something about GDPR, obviously. And today, I'd like to share some information from the business perspective, uh, what we did, and what we are currently doing to prepare uh, for GDPR and to share some learnings and uh, insights. Um, we actually started our preparation for GDPR readiness more than one year ago because we knew this will be big and this will take a lot of time. So when we started, I think we spent the first week reading the GDPR over and over again. All articles, all recitals, right? And in the end of the day, we we mapped the GDPR and our findings with um, our current or implemented practices, with our privacy policies. Um, we identified gaps, or also in cases where we didn't find gaps, we also thought about cases where we might have room for improvement in our established um, practices. Based on that, we built a uh, project plan, and um, as one of the first steps, we um, secured the um, buy-in of our executive leaders because we soon understood, okay, again, it's going to be huge and it's not only a um, project on the privacy function side or on the compliance side, but we'll have to reach out to the entire organization because some of the requirements will fundamentally change the day-to-day -day business of people who are far away from privacy topics um, in their core business so far. So we secure executive um, buy-in. We um, also pretty soon onboarded a full-time project manager to take care of all of the project management work and the cross-functional um, interaction and communication. And um, then we built the project plan. We identified at the moment, that's also um, a moving target in a way, we have identified um, 13 sub-work streams um, for all the various topics starting from uh, the governance side, including elements like um, pointing a data protection officer, updating uh, all privacy policies to bring, bring them in compliance with the uh, GDPR's uh, um, transparency requirements and so on. But also, obviously, they, uh, we have other works we've identified, data breach management, um, data protection impact assessments, documentation requirements, um, the contract side, sourcing agreements and business uh, agreements, uh, HR, and a few others. 
Um, we've um, nominated um, people throughout the organization um, to support our project. And at the moment, uh, we have a very, I think, a, a key working group with five uh, subject matter experts and, in addition, more than 40 people from all um, various um, uh, business units and uh, support functions working on the project and uh, supporting uh, this. Um, let me give you a few examples. So I would like to talk about, um, for instance, data breach management, um, about data protection impact assessments, and also the um, contract side. Um, data breach management, I think one of the big um, accomplishments of the GDPR is um, very strict requirements for um, data breach notifications. On the other hand, from a business perspective, it's a si significant challenge to um, comply with a 72 hours deadline, right? And therefore, we really fundamentally reviewed um, our whole process um, to make sure that the process can run as smooth and efficient as possible to make sure we have a chance to comply with the 72 hours deadline. Actually, recently I had a discussion with um, the head of research at the International Association of Privacy Professionals and she also asked me, what do you do with data breach management? Um, and she told me about um, basically the feedback from many, many other companies and basically all the other companies, well, many other, co other companies reported, well, we have retained a law firm and we've also retained a um, forensic company to take care of uh, the forensic uh, investigation in case of uh, an incident that could lead to a data breach. And she asked me, um, is, uh, do you have the same approach? And I was pretty, I was pretty surprised, right? Because um, as I said, our key driver was the 72 hour deadline and the um, best efficiency throughout our um, whole um, breach process and I said, no, we have a totally different approach. We have made sure that we are able to run the entire process internally to uh, make sure that we can um, perform the, the most efficient, uh, most effective process there, right? That means um, our first line of defense, it starts with very robust um, security protections on the network side, right? As a next step, also very important because that is um, the uh, moment when you actually get aware of an incident that could easily uh, lead to um, or turn out to be a data breach is the um, network monitoring, right? That means we have implemented various layers of um, capable network monitoring tools to provide us with the first flag to trigger the breach management uh, process in case there is um, an incident. Um, then we've um, made sure that we um, have the um, resources on board to run the forensic um, uh, process fully internally. That means we do not have to waste time onboarding external forensic firms, um, making them familiar with our networks, uh, providing them with access, uh, uh, getting NDAs in place and everything, right? So, but we have all the resources uh, with the um, um, throughout various um, time zones um, internally established. Um, the same is true for the legal side. We also um, are able to do the entire legal analysis of um, data breaches uh, internally and we have created a policy for data breach management dependent on uh, the criticality of the potential breach that involves various other um, uh, parts of the organization including uh, executives, including uh, comms, including uh, HR, including technical teams, including legal, and also uh, the forensic and security uh, side. And uh, with that, um, we also um, run some dry runs, uh, we believe, and we also iterated and changed the process in cases where we found out that there is room for improvement. We believe that we are um, in a good shape to um, efficiently manage potential data breaches and respond to them uh, in the very, very um, tight um, deadline. Um, that is one example. And actually, um, I also had very interesting discussions recently because um, the um, data breach notification rule in the GDPR, I think it's a fair statement to say it was inspired by um, breach laws in, in the United States, right? However, um, some um, severe data, or a series of severe data breaches in the US in the past uh, months 
led um, also to um, a different thought process over there, right? Because they have very strong breach laws uh, in place on the state level, but they don't have something comparable to the GDPR or the federal red level, right? There is no um, um, uh, comprehensive um, data privacy law in place. And this leads to challenging situations also for global companies, right? In case where there is a potential breach, then this might easily not only affect the European Union or um, member states within the European Union, but uh, a number of other countries uh, throughout the globe. And in the US, it's particularly difficult to, um, 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 to see what are the different and par partly very um, yeah, actually partly very different requirements for data breach notifications on state level. Like right now, they are considering a similar approach like um, the GDPR um, for this very topic, um, data breach notification, to make sure that um, there is a, um, a new standard available, right? And that companies don't have to dive into all the various um, state laws um, to, at the end of the day, better protect uh, citizens and uh, consumers. And I think that's actually very interesting. However, um, they don't want to implement something like the 72-hours deadline, but <laughs> that's another topic. Um, my next topic is data protection impact assessment. I really like data protection impact assessments. Why? The reason is, um, in the past, as already said, privacy was often perceived as a topic for the privacy tool. Right, sitting over there in the ivory tower and taking care of the privacy topics. But uh, the data protection impact assessments really move the needle from within an organization from the privacy function to the business, right? Because the privacy function can support data protection impact assessments and we provide a template. We make sure that we integrate uh, the processes with our systems, with um, risk management tools in our company and so on. But in the end of the day, the actual assessment the actual assessment needs to be uh, performed and uh, in the business, right? It means today people like um, software developers, um, software engineers, um, product managers and so on have to think about privacy day and day and day. And day. So, and that's actually a very good uh, change in my opinion, right? Because um, with that, uh, this easily leads to um, change of the DNA and the mindset throughout the company um, and that's in my opinion a very good achievement. As said, um, what we've implemented is we've uh, separated two things. <coughs> One is the so-called threshold analysis which is the first step for data protection impact assessments to um, find out if a certain use case would lead to a um, high risk and the high risk would be the trigger for um, conducting the actual data protection impact assessments. And uh, right now, our business teams are very busy um, conducting these um, threshold analysis and also the data protection impact assessments in cases where they are required. Um, my third topic are um, data processing agreements. Um, which is also um, for many colleagues in other European uh, countries a game changer, right? Because, um, let's say, the requirements for um, data processing agreements in uh, the GDPR are uh, pretty close to the requirements that we already knew in the Federal Data Protection Act um, here in Germany. But for many colleagues in other European countries, those requirements uh, went way beyond what they had so far in their national data protection laws. So that was interesting for us and this was also the reason why we started drafting new um, GDPR compliant data processing agreements um, already um, a year ago. We've implemented them in our processes on the um, procurement side but also um, on the business model side where needed um, last year in April which led partly to interesting conversations because many uh, other companies were not even aware of the GDPR or said, oh, yeah, we have to think about it, please um, come back to us in uh, December or whatever. So um, that was also um, very interesting. Um, my recommendation generally for uh, smaller businesses is um, if you're not already started, your GDPR preparations um, start small but start right away. And uh, you should also make sure that you assign uh, responsibilities, right? Because um, you cannot take care of everything on your own. 
you have to make sure that uh, your business teams su support your GDPR readiness activities and therefore you have to assign responsibilities to make sure you get the process going. Um, another topic um, that is um, close to my heart actually is um, the e-privacy regulation and um, I would like to give you um, two use cases. The first use case is um, it, it's 3 a.m. in the morning, I'm sleeping, and um, my fridge is very smart, and it knows that I want to have milk in the morning for my breakfast, but unfortunately, um, I'm running out of milk. There is no milk in the fridge. Therefore, the fridge makes sure that it reaches out to an online vendor and orders milk for me, and uh, the milk will be delivered uh, by a drone and a parcel um, on my balcony. Right. While I'm sleeping, that means in the morning I get up and I'm very happy um, because I have my milk in the fridge. Right. That's, this is one use case that, um, and we are actually working on topics such as um, drones and drone deliveries, drone navigation and so on. The topic is close to um, our business and uh, it is a good example to test actually um, where we are with privacy law and what we have to um, accomplish um, in the future. because. If you think about the process that is required, the communication that is required to enable um, this convenient service for me, right? then it certainly involves information that may not be considered as personal data, and a ton of information that is clearly personal data. And I'm sleeping. Right? I'm not involved in this communication. Machines are communicating on behalf of me, um, hopefully in my best interest. And um, that, that is one use case. My second use case is I'm sitting in a highly automated vehicle. That means a vehicle without a steering wheel. I'm the passenger. I'm reading a book or I'm uh, making a phone call or I run some searches in the internet. And the vehicle is driving me from A to B. While I'm driving from, from A to B, I mean, the vehicle has no steering wheel. So who is the driver of the vehicle? Data is the driver of the vehicle. Um, to make sure the vehicle can navigate um, safely from A to B, it has to communicate with various other uh, partners, be it um, other vehicles for safety reasons in the close vicinity, be it, um, uh, be it part pieces of the infrastructure, road signs, billboards, be it um, um, third parties to provide, uh, for instance, navigation uh, services or also for convenience purposes. And um, ideally, I, as a passenger, I want to have the most seamless user experience, right? I want to read my book, I don't want to be uh, disturbed. And that's another use case um, where um, we also have to be mindful uh, about it when we are discussing uh, GDPR, legal basis, machine-to-machine -machine communication, that uh, we allow such use cases. And, um, yeah, looking forward to discuss these topics with you.